Like I mentioned in the previous video, humans have always been interested in classifying the life. And the curiosity to understand life extends all the way back to the earliest recorded human history. But one of the things I think it's interesting and I wanted to mention is these first three pioneers into modern, perhaps, taxonomy. Uh, one was Aristotle. And Aristotle, of course, was one of the greatest philosophers in the history of the earth and the great, great Greek philosopher that everybody hears and knows about. And he actually influenced a Western taxonomy for a very, very, very long time. And he actually classified animals, plants, uh, and all these things that we know today. It was he that came up with this idea of animals and plants and things like that. And he classified them based on the, the complexity of the animal or the habitat that the animal lived in. So, for example, plants are simple, or, or so he said, uh, life forms which actually live on the land and you have birds which live on the sky and then you have uh, the animals which live on ground and so forth and so he had these different kinds of classification systems to actually stagger the animals in orders of complexity now of course that he did this based on thousands of years of human uh, society or, or evolution of human society which we already had words like animals and plants but he was the first one to try to actually create rules to actually determine um, where do you put the, each class and or at least the first one to made rules that became very popular other attempts were made before him but he was the first one to establish something that actually pervaded in the school of thought of science for, for actually thousands of years until the middle ages when it became clear that more rules were necessary and there was great also disagreement between scientists on how to name all of these organisms that were being studied. And when the Renaissance hit, a renewed interest in classification of life came in, and actually a new breed of scientists that became known as naturalists began exploring the different kinds of organisms that existed on Earth. And as they did their job, they tried to talk to each other and to actually name stuff. But the problem is everybody spoke a different language, and there was a lot of disagreement as to how to actually name the animals and so a scientist called John Ray or rather a philosopher of his time uh, published this Historia Plantarum and he figured out a way to name plants uh, using the Latin names and since there are scientists in you know Germany and, and scientists in France and science in England and scientists in I Italy and all these different scientists doing all this research with the organisms they figured out why don't we all agree on how to call the animal and let's use Latin names now, another uh, scientist named Carole Linnaeus actually took that a step further and he said, well, Aristotle has this idea of organizing ten complexity levels. We should do kind of the same. And he was the first one to come up with what we call the hierarchical classification system. And he named all animals that he could, that he could find using a, also a binomial classification where the name of the animal would be limited to two names. One that would stand for the species, which would describe last... Uh, video or what they actually meant by that which is a specific type of animal and the other one was the genus which is the group of animal that that species belong to and then he created other kinds of taxa or levels of organization uh, to establish hierarchical relationships between the animals and he became so famous for this awesome system of, of classifying um, life which is kind of analogous to the way that we classify things in geography like we talked about before in the first video, that uh, scientists like that. And then they combined that with the idea of John Ray of using the Latin names, and they actually invented what we call now the scientific name. And so remember, it was a combination or a progression of, that led to this. Uh, Aristotle comes up with the idea of classifying things hierarchically based on their role or complexity or the habitat they live in. And then Linnaeus expands on this idea to create an actual rule for, for uh, several layers or taxa of organization and they used the Latin name after what John Ray had uh, suggested. But the names that John Ray suggested were really, really long and so another advancement that Linnaeus did was that we we're going to use the genus and the species which is going to be unique, and unique enough for that to determine that name of that animal. So let's see how the scientific name actually works like. So what is this genus and species thing we're talking about? Now the species is a specific type of the animal of a one group of animals. So you see, for example, here the genus Melis on the left side, which are some different kinds of moles. And you see that the 
there's three different species they look very similar but as we know from the ecological species test they would be unable to have uh, offspring which are viable or actually able to survive or make children themselves and they're more likely different enough to be called different species likewise you see the different species of canine uh, animals in the world you have the modern wolves you have the ancient do dogs you have other wild dogs and you have all, all these different kinds of, of dogs which still exist today in the world and of course it's adaptive radiation out of, of the wolf ancestor but the key is all of these are different species and but they all same in the part of the gen same genus the genus Canis you know likewise the genus Rosa is the genus here for the roses and so but you have different species of rose which cannot make offspring with each other or at least they cannot make offspring which can then continue to make offspring with itself and then you also have the, for example, as you see, the genus Homo, which is the genus that we belong to, and we are specifically the genus uh, Homo and the species Sapiens. We even have the subspecies Sapiens, so it's like we're Homo sapiens sapiens. And anyway, this is a way that it works. Genus is the group, species is a specific group. So the scientific names are going to be what we call binomial nomenclature, and usually what you do is you're going to put the genus first and then the species. For example, the giant panda is actually named Iluropoda melano loca, and usually the Latin name is standing for something that has to do with what the animal does, and that tells us that the species of panda is actually melano loca, and the genus it belongs to, or the group, is Iluropoda. Here you see another example. Uh, even though they're both called bears, you will notice that the polar bear is in a completely different genus. It is actually called Ursus Maritimus because it's the only bear that spends a considerable amount of its time swimming. And that's why we call it Maritimus. But Ursus is this genus. Another big bear uh, that goes a shot out from Metal Lakes Academy, where the bears, it is the grizzly bear and it's called Ursus Arctos because they are pretty much a Nordic kind of bear. And you see these different kinds of things. But you see that two of them share the genus while the other one does not. And so you, what that tells you is that the grizzly bear and the polar bear are closer to, to each other than the giant panda or a different kind of bear is actually to, the, to them. Uh, but the polar bear and the, and the grizzly bear must be different species since they have the ending of the names is different. But also notice, you always write the genus first and then the species. The genus is always capitalized and the species is always lowercase. It's always a, either a Latin or a Greek name. Nowadays, we've been using some Greek names. It's also always italicized or underlined. You can also do, do it underlined. And sometimes that you can abbreviate the, the genus, you know, with the first letter and then a dot. So the, uh, the lecture guide, if you're following along with the lecture guide, it has some examples of acceptable structures for the, for the actual binomial nomenclature. And remember... Uh, anything greater than the genus, you know, if you're actually going to mention the family or the order or the class, and we're going to talk about those taxa soon, it's not necessarily going to be italicized, but it should be capitalized, okay? And so they remember those rules. So you remember, again, the polar bear and the grizzly bear are going to be more closely related, and you can tell because they share a genus. All right, so here are some examples of things you might know. Do you recognize these scientific names? Cunis lupus. What do you think that is? That is the, the modern wolf, the modern wolf. But the Canis familiaris stands for the domesticated dog. That's why it's familiaris. Homo sapiens, you should know that. We're all homos. Everyone that you see around you is a homo. Homo sapiens is our genus. And in fact, we actually have a subspecies because this homo sapiens species has evolved in the last 100,000 years to become even something even more specific. And so we actually call it homo sapiens sapiens as a sub subspecies. Sometimes you see that. We have Phillies domesticus. What do you think that is? Cats, modern cats, uh, especially the uh, domesticated cats. And you also have Phillies silvestris or wild cats. Then you have Pantera leo. Pantera leo is, is also a, a cat family, but not in the same genus as the wild cat and the domesticated cat. Pantera leo is the lion, and you should recognize that. And you also, because the Leo constellation stands for the lion, and then you have the Pantera tigris. You should see the word tigris, it kind of sounds like tiger. It is going to be the tiger. And notice that the tiger and the lion 
are in the same genus. And that's why they're close enough that they can have children together, but not necessarily make viable offspring because they're in different species. By the way, we are the only members of the Homo genus which is left on the surface of the earth. There are no more Homos around. We are the only, only Homos which are around. But notice there are two different kinds of Feli. There's two different types of Connies. There's ty different types of Pantera. We are the only Homo uh, members of that genus. And you also have Panpan. -pan. What do you think that is, Panpan? -pan? Well, that's actually the, the genus and the species for a type of plant. Does that make you a hint? No, not at all. Well, that's bamboo, and that's what actually gets eaten by the panda bear, and that's why it's called panda bear, because it eats pen, all right? And that's how you say it in that language. Anyways, the, the reason that we use these scientific names is because it actually helps avoid confusion. It leads to greater accuracy between when the science are talking, because again, remember that before John Ray's time, everybody would talk a different language to try to name the animal, uh, which, you know, in English we would name skunk, but now that we actually use the scientific name, there's less ambiguity or actually more uniformity in the, in, among taxonomists. And everybody says what it actually is called, you know. And so that's to avoid an ambiguity classification is how we do it. And also it avoids uh, misnomers. For example, you have things like uh, jellyfish, which is actually an edarian, not a fish. You have crayfish, which is actually a crustacean, so not a fish. You have silverfish, which is an insect, so again, not a fish, but the word fish makes it look like it's a fish. So sometimes when you use the natural name of the animal or the colloquial name for the animal, it misrepresents the type of classification that the animal actually belongs to. Just like in the Darians do not include uh, fish, but the jellyfish is that word fish makes you confused. So th that ambiguity or that misnomer is avoided when you use the scientific name. It also pretty much standardized the system of classification so that everybody knows where everything stands. And it, across the globe, everybody names things the same way. And it's actually an uh, organization that determines how to name this. And it's called the International Code for Binomial Nomenclature, which is maintained by the International Naming Congress. So every time that you c discover a new animal, for example, like this, the skunk, you think it's new. You're going to look it up on the International Code for Binomial Nomenclature and you're going to see, using the code, if this animal has already been named. And if you're trying to think, if you think you actually discover something new, you submit uh, the, your, your name for the Scientific uh, Naming Congress and then they will approve your name and put it in the code so that um, if another scientist then wants to know what that's called, they can just use the uh, dichotomous key that they use in the code to actually figure out the name of the animal that you're looking at. And we'll talk about dichotomous keys later in the lecture series to explain how that code actually works like. But remember, the other cool thing about this is that it helps provide insight into relationships between animals. In other words, animals that share a genus like we talked about are close to each other. Likewise, Animals that share the family are also close to each other. Uh, but the Pantera genus, for example, is in the Felidae family, which is the same family that that Felis genus is in. So you can see that the Pantera genus is related to the Felis genus. So it kind of makes make sense, right? And that's in the, in the carnivore order along with the other animals. And we'll talk more about this on the, other, the next video when we talk about hierarchical classification. So I'll stop here and I'll see you in the next video where we're going to talk about Classify, classifying life in a hierarchical method. See you guys then.